Today we have, we have the opportunity and the pleasure to speak with Representative Richard R. Stevenson, who was elected to serve the 8th District, which includes portions of Armstrong, Butler, and Mercer Counties, from the time period 2001 through 2014. Representative Stevenson, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to start off and have you first talk a little bit about your early life growing up in Mercer County, um, being that it is the area which you've come now to represent. Well, I actually didn't grow up in Mercer County. <clears throat> in my early years, I grew up in New Jersey. Moved to Mercer County um, when I was in my 30s and uh, settled there because it was a county which had uh, been my ancestral home. Mm. My uh, relatives had homesteaded there in 1844, so it had a lot of uh, meaning for me, and my wife and I chose to move back to Mercer County and start our life there. Uh, you had the opportunity to go to college and yes. pursue a degree, yes. uh, and then also on to graduate school. Could you yes. talk a little bit more about that? Well, I, uh, my college uh, career, my uh, undergraduate degree was divided by time in the Air Force. I spent uh, some of my college undergraduate years in Tennessee at Maryville College, but I graduated after my term in the Air Force from St. Francis uh, College in, in New York. Um, my degree was in psychology. And uh, then I went to work for several years uh, for RCA Corporation, a large corporation, and decided to return to school to uh, pursue my MBA, Master's in Business Administration. And uh, we moved to Boston at that time, and uh, I attended Suffolk University where I received that degree. What was your first experience into politics? I know you were ran for office locally. What was yes. that experience like? Um, well, my first experience was uh, running for Grove City Borough Council in the town where I live. And um, I had always had an interest in politics, uh, a passing interest, and uh, tried to follow it as, as best I could. Um, and some of my neighbors approached me about running for a vacant seat um, on Grove City Council, which I did. And uh, I campaigned uh, at that time with one of my daughters who was quite young in a stroller and walked through the neighborhood mm -hmm. and um, campaigned in that way and was elected and served there for eight years. Um, six of those years I served as the president of the council. During that time you also worked full time? Okay. Yes. As your own, your own boss? I had my own business, yes, for uh, over 20 years in Grove City. It was, I was a real estate appraiser and uh, developed that business, started it myself, and developed it over those years, had several people working with me in that business, and um, that was actually another reason for my getting involved in politics at the beginning, because I felt as a relative newcomer to the town and as someone starting my own business, mm -hmm. I should get involved in the community in a greater way and decided to uh, seek a position on the council, and that way broaden my broaden my base a bit. And you took the next step and went <clears throat> to run for commissioner in Mercer yes. County. Yes, I did. And that was uh, a year or so after I'd been on council. Mm -hmm. um, again, several people came to me and suggested that I should uh, be a candidate for county commissioner. That was a much greater step forward in terms of um, responsibility of the office, but also in terms of the campaign itself. Mm -hmm. And I campaigned all across the county um, campaigned quite vigorously and was elected and served four years as a commissioner and was elected to be chairman of the commissioners for those four years. And then what spurns you then to run for the Pennsylvania House of Representatives at that point? Well, during uh, my term as a commissioner, we made a number of innovative changes in the county. Uh, we privatized our county home. We uh, moved to privatize our behavioral, our MHMR department uh, into a nonprofit behavioral health commission mm -hmm. and made some uh, rather, I think, um, aggressive changes at that time, which um, caught the eye of a number of people. And one of them was my predecessor in this position, Representative Howard Fargo. Mm -hmm. And he began to talk to me during the time while I was a commissioner about perhaps running for state representative because he was thinking of retiring. and. Uh, it, it caught my interest. I was at a point in my life at that time um, where I could see myself doing that. I could um, step aside from my business somewhat. 
My children were old enough so that I felt the uh, travel to Harrisburg wouldn't be uh, a concern or an impediment to the job. And uh, I decided to take on the challenge, which I did. During that first campaign, as with most open seats, there's going to be a few challengers. Um, <clears throat> talk about going into it, uh, being that you had some campaign experience on, on the local and the county level. Uh, did your tactics change at all, being that you're running for a larger seat? Or what did you use that you found that was beneficial to win that first Well, race? I think um, my prior campaign experience was very helpful mm -hmm. in running for that seat. Um, the seat at the time encompassed parts of Mercer County, a very small part of Mercer County, uh, where I lived, uh, part of Butler County, and a very large part of Armstrong County. Prior to that campaign, I had never set foot in Armstrong County, never been there, but that was the largest geographic area in the new district for me. Um, so uh, that took some doing to campaign vigorously throughout areas where I had never been known. My uh, experience as a county commissioner was a complete unknown to most of the district, so it really wasn't that much of an advantage for me. And the campaign was against, um, in the primary, against a gentleman who had been a five-term district attorney in Armstrong County. So he was very well known there and uh, had that base of support. Uh, I knew it would be a difficult campaign, as it turned out to be. And uh, I think my uh, experience in campaigning for the Office of County Commissioner helped me a great deal in terms of campaign um, strategies, um, trying to see where I, I needed to spend the most time and those sorts of things. As it turned out, I won that primary, which was essentially the race for the seat, mm -hmm. and, um, but it was very close. And he ran a good campaign. It was a very strong campaign on both sides. But I'm proud to say it was a very clean campaign. It was not a negative campaign on either side. And uh, we both, I think, s didn't stray from the issues, but mm -hmm. um, talked about our own abilities and what we would bring to the position. You faced another challenger the very next year in your primary. Then yes. after that, never again. Yes. <laughs> so well, you must have done something <laughs> right. Well, the next the next election I had was in that was right after the next reapportionment. Mm -hmm. So uh, my second election was again much like my first in that much of my district was new to me. Mm -hmm. So I had done that before. I felt fairly confident going into it, but. Uh, in the second um, campaign, I had none of Armstrong County, but had uh, a substantial portion of Butler County now, which is where my, uh, my uh, opponent came from in that primary. And um, again, I, I applied the same techniques. I had the advantage, of course, by then of being an incumbent. Right. And um, so I had some name recognition, even in the areas where I wasn't serving mm -hmm. and uh, was able to be successful there as well. Talk about the district in a little bit more detail. Geography, demographics, uh, jobs, economic development. What types of things are, are there in, that, in those counties? Well, in my district uh, today, there are two main centers of population. One is my hometown, which is Grove City. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other is there is a community in, in Butler County, Zillianople. Those are the two boroughs which have the uh, highest population. There are other areas with a substantial population, some townships uh, in northern Butler County as well. And so those are the areas that are more um, residential in nature, um, where the uh, businesses and industries reside, and uh, where population is fairly um, condensed. Mm -hmm. The rest of the district is quite rural, and uh, there are areas of the district where um, there's quite a distance between homes, there are farms, um, that sort of thing. Overall, I would say the district is generally conservative. Um, while the, uh, the base, the Republican base, is, is quite strong, it's not overwhelming in those areas. Um, but most of the Democrats, I believe, are also fairly conservative in their values, whether it be issues of taxes, um, guns, um, right to life, those types of things, which are all issues uh, that fell in line with my beliefs. And uh, I felt very confident in representing the general population throughout the district. Of course, as with any district, there are those who disagree with those points of view. 
and make their um, their points of view well known to a representative, and that happened as it, as it might with anyone regularly. So I tried to balance the two, and uh, always provide an ear to those who disagreed with me, and uh, explain where I where I fell on the, on that issue. That leads me into my next question: uh, What types of issues do constituents most often bring to you, whether here in Harrisburg or or back in your district office? Well, it often depends on what we're doing here in Harrisburg. If it has to do with a legislative issue, mm -hmm. uh, I often don't hear from them too much until something starts to happen here in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. And that generates constituent input, whether pro or con, mm -hmm. on the issue. Um, and then they, they uh, let me know their viewpoints uh, quite readily on those issues. Aside from those issues, whether it, whether it be um, um, a tax issue, uh, or any other issue that we're dealing with, um, I hear from constituents quite regularly, some more than others, and some are very regular in their correspondence with me. What was your first impression then of, of Harrisburg and, and the House when you were first sworn in? Well, I was very excited and honored to be here. I was uh, pleased to be elected, and I've always fe felt that sense of honor in being here, and it's, this is a very special place in my, my point of view. Uh, I think this is a place um, which should be held in some high esteem because this is where the people in my area send a representative to speak for them and to stand for their, their interests. Um, I'm uh, a very strong proponent of our form of government. I believe it's, it's the best on earth and uh, I think uh, this is one of the places where that is played out on a daily basis. And uh, I've been very honored and pleased to be here. And when I first arrived here, I felt um, very excited about the opportunity ahead of me. Did you have anyone um, already established uh, come to you as a mentor uh, when you were first starting out that sort of helped you through the process? Well, one of my colleagues from Mercer County, Rod Wilt, had been here before me by a few terms. Uh, we were friends before I got here, and so I knew him fairly well. My office happened to be placed next to his in the East Wing when I was when I was assigned an office, and so I looked to him a good bit during my first couple terms mm -hmm. for general guidance and um, an understanding of the place. He was a unique um, mentor for me because his father had been here before him and his grandfather before that, so he's one of the rare mm -hmm. members here <laughs> who goes back for th went back for three generations of experience, and uh, he I think had a very good feel for this place. You served on a number of committees during your time here. Yes. Uh, what, which ones sort of stand out to you and uh, which some of, the, some of the issues that were involved in those? I know you were on, I think the longest term was environmental for a number of years. You also served in judiciary appropriations and, and the like. Well, what, which ones stand out to you? Well, I've been very fortunate in the committees that I've been able to uh, be assigned to here. I think I've, I've served on the committees in my view that, that really um, deal with the critical issues here in Harrisburg. Everything from the Finance Committee to the Environmental Committee you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Appropriations, of course, is, of course, is key every year with the budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judiciary as well. The Judiciary Committee handles more bills than any other committee here in the House. And uh, I was fortunate to serve with, I think, some great chairmen on those committees who really uh, tried to move some groundbreaking legislation in various areas, but at the same time to um, work with the committee itself in a bipartisan way to bring about um, some things that really have been helpful in, in Pennsylvania. Um, the Environmental Committee was a very interesting committee for me at the outset um, because it, it affects many people in my area. Um, coal mining, for instance, is still something that, that uh, has an effect on, on my area out there. Drilling, gas drilling has been uh, a big part of the industry in the backbone of that uh, area of Pennsylvania since Drake's well was drilled um, many, many years ago. Mm. So those are some of the concerns of my constituents, and I was able to, uh, I think, speak on their behalf on uh, many of those issues and try to support industries which quite often come under fire from folks uh, who are con more concerned about the environment, I think, than, than some other things. Not that these industries are not concerned about the environment. I don't want to leave that impression. The people who work there and who run those businesses are, are very much in tune with what they're doing 
and do everything they can under the law to protect uh, the environment as well. You also authored a few bills that became law. I yes. think we had about nine on, on our record. Yes. Which one of those stand out to you, and uh, what are some of the, the background of those bills that we don't get to hear about very often? Well, um, I guess I would, I would speak in a general way. They, they were all important to me, of course, at the mm -hmm. time for various reasons. But I think the key to it is I've had um, perhaps I had more bills passed into law under Governor Rendell, a Democrat, while I was a Republican than I have as a Republican <laughs> under Republican governors. Uh, it's about half and half, but um, the um, interesting thing was I think that shows that working across the aisle with my colleagues, with committee chairmen, and having a bill which is a good idea or whose time has come, I think um, rises it above politics. And I think there were many times where I worked with good friends, colleagues on the other side to help advance a bill and uh, get it through the House and also through the Senate mm -hmm. when uh, otherwise it would have seemed unlikely that that could happen. And there was also bills that you haven't authored that you worked tirelessly on. I know I-80 was, was a big issue yes. for you in your area. Uh, I, I, I know you, there, there was a pace net you were involved with and, and things like that. Could you speak a little bit about those? Well, the I-80 uh, bill was one which would had it been ta uh, tolled at that time, and that was when I-80 was being considered as a toll road in order to raise money for transportation projects under Governor Rendell. Uh, it was very clear in my district, because um, I-80 runs through the heart of my district, mm -hmm. that it would have had a devastating effect on many of the businesses and individuals in that area. Um, I do believe that at some point, interstates will probably be tolled in order to pay, for the, pay the cost of maintenance and upkeep. However, I felt at the heart of it, it was unfair to choose only one interstate and toll it. Why, if you're going to toll the interstates, why not toll the whole interstate system? Interstate 80 at the time and still runs through perhaps the most economically challenged areas of Pennsylvania, the northern tier. And to put the toll on the road at that time and uh, lay that burden on those businesses and those individuals, I felt was inherently unfair. And for that reason, I argued against it, uh, went to Washington on one occasion to testify against it. And in the end, uh, we were successful, I believe, when Washington uh, mm -hmm. agreed that it wasn't being done in the right way. Um, the other bills, Pace, PaceNet, those are things which I think are very critical to Pennsylvania and something that uh, we needed to move forward with. And I was pleased to be a part of those discussions and debates as well. What are some of, of, maybe these issues are included in that, but what are some of the issues that you find are the toughest votes to make? I think the toughest votes to make are the ones that um, perhaps put you in conflict uh, personally with your own core beliefs and what you believe might be the direction your constituents would want you to go. Uh, fortunately, I haven't had uh, I can't even think of one right now, but I know there are people who struggle with those those um, votes. Normally, I feel I have a, have a good sense of uh, the constituents in the 8th District after serving there for a number of years and feel comfortable with um, the decisions I make. But those are the decisions which are most difficult. The second most difficult would probably deci be decisions about what you feel might be in the best inter interest of the Commonwealth. but at the same time might differ from either your past votes mm -hmm. or the, um, the messages you're getting from your constituents. I do believe there are times here in the legislature where you're elected to lead and where you feel there is something that has to happen. And although it may be unpopular, mm -hmm. um, there is a time to move forward. I think something we're facing today in the pension crisis is one such example. Uh, many people would rather not deal with it, would rather push it aside, but I think the unfunded liability we're looking at there is something that has to be addressed and dealt with. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, being that this is your, your, your last term, there seems to be so many big issues uh, aside from the budget. You still have Marcellus Shale issues. You still have, we just passed the, the large transportation bill, um, the privatization of the liquor stores. 
um, maybe a possible expansion in gambling, things like that are still on the table, the pension crisis. Um, how do you weigh through all of those big issues within a short amount of time and then try to work with the House, the Democrats, the Senate, the governor's office to bring some type of resolution to those? Well, it's been interesting for the last, um, this term and the prior term, I've served on the leadership team mm -hmm. in the Republican uh, caucus. And uh, as such, I've been privy to some inside discussions on all those issues you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, th it is very difficult, it's particularly when you have a large caucus as we do with 111 members, mm -hmm. um, people who come from wide ranging viewpoints based on districts which differ substantially even though they may all be Republicans. Um, that is always the challenge to bring people together to address an issue and try to make sure that as many points of view as possible are being addressed. Um, and it is not easy. That's why these, these major issues sometimes languish for a term or two or three. Uh, the privatization of the liquor stores has been out there for decades mm -hmm. and this is the first time it's passed the House of Representatives and come close in the Senate, may still pass the Senate in some form, but that's an issue uh, many people feel whose time has come and uh, to try to find that balance, to try to find the um, magic formula if you will in that particular bill to gain enough votes to pass and for the governor to support it is always the challenge. It's more easy, it's easier on um, perhaps a, um, a smaller bill, naturally, mm -hmm. but these affect so many people and affect um, the way we do business in Pennsylvania, they're much, much uh, more difficult. Is there anything in the legislative process you would change to make it either easier to get some of these larger bills passed, or you think the process is fine the way it is? Well, I've supported, during the last two terms, I've supported the bill to reduce the size of the legislature. And initially I was, I was opposed to that because I felt it might weaken the position of rural legislators like myself. Sure. But the more I looked at that and the more I listened to the arguments, I became convinced that uh, the House with 203 members is a cumbersome organization. And uh, in the current era we live in with electronic communication, um, managing your district is much, much different than it was 50 or 100 years ago. Um, now we hear from constituents most often through email and uh, many of our communications are done that way. Things move more rapidly and uh, I think communication is, is um, perhaps somewhat quicker. Because of that I think uh, it would be possible to manage or oversee a district, represent a district, mm -hmm. even if it were like a third larger which is perhaps what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I feel that that would reduce the number of members here, which would, I think, enhance the debate and move things along perhaps a little bit more quickly and a little better. What is the role of the caucus administrator, the position you now hold within the caucus? Um, the short answer is I tend to think of it as the caucus business manager. <laughs> I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of many of the aspects of the, ca of the caucus, mm. things as mundane as printing. Uh, office space, parking space, uh, just general operations within the caucus. Um, if people have a difficulty with a, a piece of furniture or if there's something that's not working somewhere in the caucus, um, those are the kinds of things that we address uh, through our office. And uh, it can be quite busy at times, particularly with the print, print shop, which is mm -hmm. a major operation for the caucus. Um, and. Uh, things as mundane as parking tend to take up a lot of time as well. Now that's a position you have to run internally on. Yes. What's the difference in running internally versus facing your constituents back home? Well, that's, that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, the difference I would say is that when you're running for a caucus position, you're first of all running among your peers mm -hmm. who've all been elected themselves. These are all people who are very familiar with the political process and how campaigns are run and structured, so you're campaigning among campaigners. And um, I think it's, uh, it's interesting, but it's, uh, it's very challenging to run in that, in that environment. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that I was able to serve in that position and that 
the members of my caucus had the confidence in me to elect me. A lot has been said over the course of the last number of terms. Th things have seemed to go on, more, on a more partisan route. Has that always been the case that you've seen throughout your term? Um, what has been the inter caucus relationships been like? Well, I think, you know, that's been a topic of conversation both in Harrisburg and in Washington of late, mm. that things are much more partisan than they used to be. I'm not totally convinced that's true. I think it is sometimes, especially when you're approaching a gubernatorial election or a major election where there's a battle for control of the institution. The majority party is the one who sets the agenda and uh, essentially is in charge of what we do and what we, try to what we try to achieve. So naturally, both parties want to be in that position where they're setting the agenda and trying to move their uh, issues forward. Um, I don't know that it's become more partisan here since I've been here. I think it it's always been somewhat partisan in those areas. I think the difficulty has been um, the General Assembly, I think, has, has changed dramatically since I've been here for several reasons. Um, and one has been um, the criticism that's been leveled against the General Assembly because of several of the episodes that have happened here over the past decade. Um, I think uh, we were always we're always going to tend to be partisan, and I think that's something that is inherent in a political office, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because you're representing the ideals of the people you feel you represent. Our form of government was set up, in my view, to be somewhat contentious. I know occasionally people ask me when I'm doing a town hall meeting or some other gathering, they ask me, why don't you people all just get along down there in Harrisburg? And I tell them that we weren't elected to get along. We were elected to fight for certain positions and to argue in favor of things we believe in. Um, people are elected by constituents, expected to do certain things, and if they step forward and try to do those, naturally not everyone's going to agree with them. So there will be debate, there will be arguments, but the beauty of our system is that through those debates, through those arguments, through the committee hearings, through the amendment process, mm -hmm. through all of that, a bill will emerge and it will either pass or fail based on the final vote. And that's how our system was set up to be, set up to operate. It keeps us from revolution in the streets, if you will, but at the same time, it does lead to uh, sometimes acrimonious debate and argument. You talked about uh, the advent of technology. Yes. Uh, and forms of communication reaching out to your constituents. But there's also another side of that, which is the media coverage that goes along with that. Right. Um, how has that affected how you performed at your job or, or as the General Assembly as a whole, positive or negative? Well, I think, I think it's... Uh, it can be both. Um, me personally, in my uh, 14 years here, I think I've been um, generally fairly treated by the media. Um, I don't always agree with everything they say, certainly everything they say about me, perhaps. But um, on the whole, I think they try to do a f relatively fair job of reporting. The thing that has bothered me, I guess, has been the um, criticism of the General Assembly as a body. And um, it's often mentioned that the public has a very low regard for the General Assembly when polled, but often a very high regard for their individual mm -hmm. representative or senator. And I think there's a message in that. I think um, if the media would take time to look at that and what that means, um, that means that we have people who are elected who are doing what they're supposed to be doing, by and large. They're working hard for their district. They're representing their district well. Uh, they're honorable in, in the way they do that and uh, fight, for, fight for positions which they believe in or they believe that their constituents believe in. That gives them individually high regard. I think the criticism of the, the body as a whole um, is perhaps unfair because um, the body as a whole is made up of the individuals who, who comprise it. 
and too often that's not that's not the picture that's painted. Why now is is the time to leave appropriate for you? Well, uh, I think it's just I feel I've I've accomplished a good bit here. I'm up at an age where retirement has become has become more appealing to me in the last few years. Um, it was a challenge when I set out to do it. I think I've accomplished many of the goals I set, mm -hmm. set out to accomplish. And I also believe that people can stay too long. I think that is, uh, I'm no, I have no one in mind here when I say this, but uh, I think there is a time in the, in the elected process for new ideas, for n people with new energy um, to approach the job. And uh, I think that's, that keeps it healthy, keeps it vibrant, and um, keeps it moving forward. Looking back, what would you say, uh, what aspect of the job would you say you enjoyed the most? I would say probably the um, interaction with my constituents. That was prob that's probably gives me the most satisfaction um, and gives me a feeling that I've really made a difference because it's differences to individual people. People who have a problem with the state at some level or another they come to our office to, for assistance, and in many cases we're able to, if we can't solve the problem for them, we're able to uh, at least help them understand the issue, uh, bring some clarity to it. But in many cases we're able to uh, resolve it for them. And uh, it's something they could not have resolved on their, self, on their own perhaps, but uh, when we can help them in that way, it's very satisfying. Are there any regrets or disappointments that you're leaving here with? Not really, not really. I think, by and large, it's, it's been a very fulfilling experience. The only regret I have is that uh, I think sometimes, as I said, indicated earlier, I think, um, I think the institution as itself has come under heavy criticism in the last decade. Some of it self-inflicted self and well-deserved, perhaps. But I think throughout that process, I hope we don't lose sight of the fact that this is a very valuable institution, one that's necessary um, to give people a voice in what's happening in their commonwealth in the state of Pennsylvania. And um, that's something that I get concerned about when people express frustration with the institution itself, often as a result, as a result of media coverage. When, when you talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, many times they don't understand the process. Sure. And I know we live in a 24-hour in a, uh, news cycle or maybe a five-minute news cycle sometimes, so it's very difficult to get the background, to get the understanding about why this is valuable, both here and in Washington, that we have a system of debate, a system of interaction, uh, so that ideas can be fully vetted and fully debated and then voted upon. Did you ever consider, or will you ever consider, running for another office? No, I think I'm, I've, um, I've had other opportunities through the years, and um, I've thought about it at that time, and I think this is the right time for me to step aside. What lessons have you learned that you'll take with you, either from the politics or the people that you interacted with here at the House? Well, I've learned that this is truly an, a, a very interesting and amazing place. It really is. And I'm very proud to have served here. It's been an honor. And I've learned that, um, by and large, the members here, both House and Senate, both sides of the aisle, are truly people who are engaged, who want to be here, who want to uh, address the issues that lie before us, and want to make Pennsylvania a better place. That's not a story you hear very often, but on an individual basis, that's, that's what's going on here in Harrisburg. And I'm very pleased and proud to have been a part of it. What would your advice be for people, young people, or people just looking to get into running the office for the first time? What would you say to them? I would encourage them. I think that's one of the um, real concerns I have as I leave public office, that too many people in our country have decided that public office is not worthy. It's not something that should be pursued. And this goes back to some of my earlier comments about the constant criticism of our elected bodies, whether it be here or Washington. Um, 
I've seen people in these offices who work diligently, very hard, day in, day out, to accomplish what they hope to accomplish, to serve the people they represent. And uh, we need people who are committed to that, who believe in this system of government, who believe in giving of themselves, because it is a somewhat selfless position, and giving of themselves to the greater good. And there are tremendous rewards in that, but you have to take that first step. And it's very difficult to make that commitment at the beginning. Having done it several times myself, I know that when you step forward and say, I'm going to be a candidate, suddenly people look at you somewhat differently, not always in a good way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to be ready for that and be re willing to step forward to try to serve our country or our commonwealth in a way that will, will help us, keep us strong, and move us forward. Lastly, how would you want your tenure as a state representative to be remembered? I'd like to be remembered as someone who uh, did the things I just talked about, who served his constituency honorably, who tried to do the best he could to move the issues forward that he felt were important to them and to himself and to the Commonwealth, and uh, operated in a straightforward and, and uh, direct manner with the people I dealt with. Um, I think I'd like people to know that I'm very pleased that I did this, very happy I did it, and very proud of it. Uh, this has been a, a great chapter in my life, one which I never would have anticipated early in my life. And I'm very happy it happened, and uh, I was pr proud to be here. Well, I want to thank you again, Representative Stevenson, for taking the time to speak with us today, and I wish you much luck. Thank you very much. Thanks for interviewing me.